Hello and welcome to our first edition of Primetime Watchmaking the News of 2024 and it's therefore time to shift our focus back on some business related stories and of course some of the latest watch releases. But before delving into the abyss of horological marvels, I'd like to remind you that we've recently uh, released a few uh, videos, among them our signature watch porn video featuring some of the best watches filmed in 2023. Always a pleasurable moment if you go by your many comments. So in addition to this, we also published two very interesting interviews with some of the most uh, knowledgeable figures in our watchmaking universe. Dr. Helmut Krott, who has uh, provided horological expertise to the world's major auction houses for over 50 years. He, well, he presented his own collection of urban the Jorgensen timepieces spanning from 1800 to the present day. And by the way, he is also a foundation council member of Oropedia. Well, this is an interesting video to learn about the brand and its future under the new leadership. Link below. And we also have a great interview with Darren Schneiper, Senior Vice President and Chairman of the International Watch Division at Sotheby's. This time, Darren shared her own story of working at Sotheby's, some never heard before anecdotes about the auction she assisted, as well as her vision of the future of sales. We also published a really interesting video on what has become the true design signature of Al Langen Sinne with their oversized date. And the origin of this characteristic feature comes from the Dresden 5-minute opera clock, and you'll know all about it in this report. I mean, it's quite long and uh, quite thorough, and you'll also get to know about the evolution of the Lange one over time. Link below and enjoy. So let's now discuss business and numbers and start with a significant event uh, that unfolded in January and could potentially hurt the entire horological ecosystem in 24. The Watches of Switzerland Group announced revised estimates for the results of 2023, leading to an immediate 30% decrease in the price of their shares. Yeah, brutal reality check. So the initial uh, guidance shared with the London Stock Exchange in uh, November projected sales increase of 8 to 10 percent for the financial year, which concludes on April the 30th. Unfortunately for the group, uh, there have been uh, slight adjustments to these estimates, and the total revenue for 23 is now expected to be 188 million Swiss franc lower than initially predicted. Several factors contributed to this outcome, uh, but the main one reflects the group's reluctance to respond to market changes and trends, but also a very clear example of its dependency to the crown. And with Rolex's decision to reduce allocation of its more expensive models in uh, precious metals to some retailers, well, the combination of this resulted in this complex situation for watches of Switzerland and actually makes it today a potential target. But who would like to make such a move today remains quite an open question. So we can think of a few players capable of doing so with the main objective of consolidating uh, their retail and distribution network. But in such uh, uncertain times, uh, I can only imagine how, th uh, how tough these negotiations would be. But nonetheless, I mean, this reflects quite well what we've been hearing about the reality of the evolution of certain markets. And this precisely uh, leads me to another piece of news that needs to be taken with a bit of caution. So especially when you put this in perspective of some of the group's announcements regarding their performances, something that I will develop in a very short while. So according to recent statistics published by the Federation of the Swiss Watch Industry, 23 marks the third consecutive record-breaking year for this luxury sector, with a growth rate of 7.6% compared to 22. So the industry amassed a staggering 31 billion US dollars, that's 26.7 billion Swiss franc, in total export value over the last 12 months. But please keep in mind that these numbers reflect the exports figures only, something slightly different than watches being actually sold and it neither takes into consideration watches that have been re-imported in Switzerland, i.e. stocks uh, difficult to sell. This FH report also highlights that the fastest growing markets for Swiss watches include Ireland plus 26.6%, Hong Kong plus 23.4%, Thailand plus 17.1%, India plus 16.5, Mexico plus 16.1, and Australia plus 14.4, with the USA and China still leading the charts for the largest number of, of uh, timepieces sold. It is worth noting that the most significant impact was clearly made by watches export prices under 200 Swiss franc and those priced above 3,000 Swiss franc, with the continuously growing demand for timepieces made from materials other than precious, uh, precious metals. And this continues to highlight that the mid-range uh, watches, those that should reflect volumes, are still facing a considerable challenge within that price segment. 
So overall, numbers seem to be good, even historic, but when you listen to some recently communicated results by group, well, then you rapidly feel that the situation is probably not exactly as pretty. And let's start with the Swatch Group. They just published their results for the year, and it appears that their affordable yet not very colorful models from the group's uh, brands collaboration have not yielded tangible results. The operating profit of the group in 23 so far is uh, reportedly as a slightly close to 1.2 billion Swiss franc, which is only 33 million more than uh, compared to 22. And the most significant impact on the Swatch Group's performance was made by the strong Swiss franc, and this is something which obviously concerns every single brand having to uh, sometimes adjust their local pricing strategy to prevent being completely out of reach. But as you can imagine, this induces a bit of a distortion, which is not a great thing. So coming back to the released report and to illustrate this, the most uh, considerable detrimental effect on their result was caused by currency fluctuation, which, which stood at 554 million Swiss francs. The efforts uh, to adjust prices were insufficient to counteract the swift decline of major currencies relative to the Swiss franc because it would simply increase their prices too much. However, the group is quite optimistic about the outcome of 24, and we've definitely heard this before. I mean, in fact, Mr. Hayek anticipates excellent opportunities for further growth in local currencies, with the jewelry brand Harry Winstead expected to surpass 1 billion in turnover, a brand which has become slightly invisible uh, in the watch segment. Swatch, Tissot, and Longines will continue to develop uh, strongly in the lower and medium uh, price segment, while Omega will benefit from the global media presence as uh, being the official timekeeper of the Olympic Games in Paris. China is expected to be a key market still, uh, thanks to the rising demand in uh, lower and medium price segments. However, exchange rate movement will continue to impact the group's results, and I doubt we can only blame this for their performance. I mean, it's quite a nice or, let's say, convenient way to give a positive outlook, but uh, leave some space uh, for failure, maybe. So next in line is the full chain of uh, CEO transition under the LVMH umbrella. Frédéric Arnaud, 29, who has been at the helm of Tag Heuer since 2020, has been appointed CEO of a newly created LVMH uh, watches operation overseeing Hublot, Tag Heuer, and Zenith. He will report to Stéphane Bianchi, CEO of the LVM8 Watches and Jewelry Division, and Julien Tornard, who has been uh, the acting CEO of Zenith since 2017, is now taking over Arnaud's seat at Tag Heuer, and we wish him well with this uh, new responsibility. Meanwhile, Zenith is now chaired by the former Regional Managing Director for Tag Heuer Middle East, Benoit de Clare, known also for his previous work at IWC and Panerai. So as with any appointment, well, these changes have sparked numerous questions and uh, discussions regarding Frédéric Arnaud's uh, suitability for this position and his ability to, uh, to lead the pack. Also, well, will uh, there be a sort of a concurrence with Jean Arnaud, who is in charge uh, of marketing and development for watches at Louis Vuitton? Well, time will tell, but it seems that LVMH is entering a new year fully loaded to impress, and we'll get on the watches recently relieved, uh, revealed in Miami in a short while. So the 2023 results for the group were not bad at all. I mean, featuring an average organic growth of 13% compared to 22, and showcasing that demand for luxury good is still very strong. However, final figures were also jeopardized by exchange rate fluctuation. But if you take the watches and jewelry division, uh, things were a bit less exciting with a 7% increase compared to 22, and this mainly achieved uh, from the jewelry part. As stated in the group's uh, press release, uh, this current year, however, promises to be inspiring and exceptional, apparently. And this is uh, largely due to LVMH's uh, partnership with the uh, Paris uh, 2024 Olympic Games and Paralympic Games, of course. However, it's important to note that it is uh, Omega, I just mentioned it, uh, which will be the horological partner of the Olympics, but LVMH will be playing on home turf. And to close the LVMH chapter, I just wanted to congratulate our friend Raoul Pages, the very inspired independent watchmaker, who just won the first of the LV watch prizes, uh, rewarding the creativity of uh, the independent scene. So the creation of such a prize by Louis Vuitton is naturally very smart, but difficult not to think that there is some kind of master plan uh, behind it. But let's go back to some performance review and let's talk Richemont, who didn't really fare well either. I mean, despite some uh, minor growth in the jewelry sector in 23, 
The group achieved only a plus four increase in revenue at actual rates compared to 22. In watches, there was even a small decline of minus 1%, but the brands that prevented the, uh, the watches sector of the group uh, from facing a harsher reality were Arlang & Zene, IWC, Jager Le Coultre, and Vacheron Constantin. So I hope they will all be able to perform better this year, uh, which will surely be maybe a little bit less profitable uh, than the prosperous uh, post-COVID years for many reasons. So let's switch uh, business environment and focus rapidly on the auction world, as we have plenty of these in the spring here in Geneva and some of these houses, especially those that were in a controversial state at the end of 23, have already announced their New York editions, which are planned for the end of February, focused uh, around private collections of megastars. And I'm talking about Christie's sale of the contents of Sir Elton John's home in Atlanta, including 32 timepieces, 13 by Cartier, 5 Chopin, even unique ones, 4 Hublots and a leopard print uh, uh, Rolex Daytona. So if you're in New York, don't miss the opportunity to attend the preview of the sales, of course. But talking about collector, Philips, in association with Bax & Russo, just announced another thematic sale with 40 lots put on auction later in May, belonging to one of the world's most prominent collector, Mr. Guido Mondani. He is the founder of the eponymous uh, publishing house and is widely known in the collecting community for his utter watchmaking passion with pieces ranging from the full spectrum of the value proposition. Well, I really hope we'll come back on this auction and especially have the opportunity to do an interview with Mr. Mondani. I mean, his watchmaking journey can only be a fascinating one. Okay, next, and Sotheby's, on the other hand, has partnered with the Swatch Group to play the Moon Swatch card, and this time for a noble cause. Omega and Swatch are teaming up to auction 11 suitcases containing the full Mission to Moonshine Gold collection through Sotheby's from February the 12th to the 24th. So each suitcase will include 10 identical watch cases, each with uh, uniquely designed Moonshine Gold second hands, plus the Blue Moon edition, which is inspired by the highly uh, coveted Mission to Neptune case. And it is the first time these models will be officially offered together in one set outside of eBay. And the positive aspect here is that 100% of the proceeds uh, from the sale will be donated to the Orbis International, an organization that combats avoidable blindness and vision loss around the world and has been supported by Swatch since 2011. And now for some light news and a clear reminder for you to declare your expensive watches if you want to travel abroad. I mean, at least in theory. So Arnold Schwarzenegger in the middle of January was held at Munich airport after failing to declare an expensive watch which happened to be an AP. So the timepiece was donated to the Schwarzenegger Climate Initiative and was due to be auctioned off at an event in the Austrian ski resort of Kidsburg. It appears that the Terminator actually tried to declare the watch but didn't find a declaration paper at the airport and just took the watch in a box on board. So this resulted in a fine for the actor of 33,000 Swiss francs, including 4,000 in tax and 5,000 penalty, according to the Bild newspaper here. But ultimately, the watch fetched 256,000 Swiss francs at the climate auction, so everything ended well for everybody. Hasta la vista, baby. And to finish the business part of primetime, I would like to tell you that uh, you can now get your tickets for Watches and Wonders. So the show will open its door to the general public for the very first time over three days, from April the 13th to the 15th, with a total of 54 exhibiting maisons participating this year. And don't forget that there will be a, a free in-the-city program with uh, different uh, watchmaking-related uh, cultural and educational activities, and a new watchmaking village on the Pont de la Machine, plus a DJ evening on April the 11th and street performance throughout the city. You can find the direct link to the ticketing office below the video and for info tickets cost 70 Swiss francs, so not super cheap, but going by the success of last year, well, I'm pretty sure there will be, again be a strong attendance and I just hope brands will continue to play the game as they did in 23. I mean, it's important and contributes to this B2C dimension the event needs to cater for. But if you don't want to wait until April, well, you're welcome to visit Inorgenta, the Munich watch, jewelry and gemstone show, which will take place from February the 16th to the 19th. 
And this will be the 50th anniversary of the Munich show, which has been a showcase for the industry and a platform for the, for the trade since 74. So the Salon established itself as a place to open up new markets and has welcomed brands from important countries and many big names of the industry. And this time, Inurgenta will uh, be held at the Show Palace de Munich, one of the largest uh, stages of Europe, something you definitely don't want to miss if you're in the region. And now it's time for watches. So first up is a nice collaboration between uh, Audemars Piguet and haute couture designer Tamara Ralph. And although uh, the new Royal Oak concept flying tourbillon limited edition may not be entirely new, uh, almost the same watch uh, with a stunning frost finishing used uh, for the first time on the gold uh, Dunn case was uh, presented in 2020. And this finishing derived from a Florentine technique revived by AP in uh, 2016 definitely adds an interesting touch to the timepiece. Inside the recent uh, 18 karat pink gold edition is a hand worn caliber 2964 featuring a balance wheel beating at 3 Hz and uh, with a minimum uh, uh, power reserve of 72 hours. So the case is a sleek 38.5 mm with a height of 11.9 and the edition is limited to 102 pieces. Inside the 18 karat pink gold uh, edition is a hand bone caliber 2964 featuring a balance wheel uh, beating at 3 Hz and uh, with a minimum uh, power reserve of 72 hours. And the case is a sleek 38.5 uh, mm uh, with a height of 11.9 and the edition is limited to 102 pieces. What sets this model apart is the captivating optical illusion of the void inside the dial. I mean, such an effect was achieved through a palette of graded hues, uh, ranging from brown and bronze to golden tones. And it is something destined uh, to spark conversation, so I would recommend at least trying it on your wrist. We are all familiar with the horological tradition of crafting timepieces dedicated to an uh, animal of the year according to the Chinese calendar. And while for other dragons have been a popular theme in various shades of green, H. Moser and company once again breaks uh, from convention to present something refreshing. Although not directly tied to the theme of the year, I mean the streamliner tourbillon Wyoming Jade incorporates the colors associated with the featured animal gold and green. So the decorative stone dial is carved from jade sourced in Wyoming, USA. It is cut into thin slices of 1 to 1.2 millimeter using CNC technology in a liquid environment. So the slices are meticulously hand polished to eliminate any chips or scratches, highlighting the natural brilliance of the jade, and then affixed to a brass base. The absence of the logo and the presence of just three indices perfectly underscores the elegant simplicity of the timepiece, something we clearly appreciate uh, from the brand. And underneath a slightly domed sapphire crystal, you will find the automatic HMC 804 caliber, powering the watch and equipped with a double hairspring design and produced in-house by H. Moses' sister company, Precision Engineering. The 40 mm case is crafted from 5N red gold and has a height of 12.1 mm. The sad news is that it is limited to just 100 pieces, so you can be sure that this model is probably already sold out. Another interesting launch comes from Code 41, the first participatory community brand in Swiss mechanical watchmaking based in Lausanne. So for those who haven't heard of it before, I mean, the brand has been on the market for 10 years and its name is a reference to the phone code of Switzerland. And at the helm of the brand, you have Claudio D'Amore, who spent more than 10 years uh, designing models for different watch brands such as Tiger Heuer, Oris, Parmigiani, Fleurier and Montblanc before launching his own project in 2016. Last year, we introduced you to their uh, pretty cool rectangular timepiece Megascape. And now in 24, while well, Code 41 has shifted to a more classic complication requested by the community. The Moon Inception is equipped with a Moon Phase complication and a C41-MP caliber developed by Code 41 based on the Celita architecture. It is important to note that uh, this Inception has received a COSC certification for precision within uh, minus four plus six uh, seconds, but this certification is interestingly proposed as an option. The watch measures 41.5 mm and weighs 95 grams without the strap, and the power reserve is sufficient for approximately two days of use. Pre-order for this uh, Moon Inception is now open until April the 23rd, and we know most have already been sold. Okay, next uh, piece with the new tourbillon tremblage introduced by Maurice Grossman, a completely different story. A standout feature of the tremblage model is, is naturally its dial, meticulously crafted from German silver in a symmetrical layout. 
The inner section showcases tremblage engraving, a traditional technique uh, revived for this timepiece, hand engraved using a variety of special tools named burin. And these burins move across the dial in a trembling motion, hence its French name, tremblant, meaning to tremble in English. This timepiece comes with a flying three minute tourbillon with stop seconds and measures 44.5 mm in width and 13.8 in height. It operates on an in-house 103.0 caliber with an impressive 72 hours of power reserve. And even though it's a bit hefty, this model epitomizes high quality watchmaking. Okay, I did mention LVMH previously, and they just held their uh, yearly watch week in Miami to showcase some of the watches to be released this year. And there are a few interesting ones. So let's start with Hublot, who came up with a piece which reminded quite a few things. And this watch is the MP10 Tourbillon Weight Energy System. And on the design perspective, well, it clearly stands out with this original titanium case of 54.1 millimeter in height, 41.5 in width, but 22.4 in thickness. And yes, there's, uh, that was needed to house this extravagant mechanism made of approximately 600 components. In terms of time display, you have uh, two rollers, one for the hour, the other for the minutes, and you will find the seconds on the 35 degrees inclined tourbillon at six o'clock. One of its interesting features resides in the automatic system, which uses linear gold weights, something seen before, for instance, with uh, some quorum uh, models and its famous golden bridge or the tag Monaco V4. But you can also wind it with the special crown found at 12 o'clock, giving you a power reserve of 48 hours. In a way, I do feel a bit of the cabestan vibe to this piece, though Hublot has been working on it since almost 10 years. Anyhow, I mean, it's quite a crazy piece of demonstration of mechanical expression and as you can imagine this piece is limited in this case to 50 pieces well at least for the time being and comes with a comfortable price point set at 250,000 Swiss franc. Still with Hublot the brand pursue its collaboration with French artist Richard Orlinski and are now coming with two pretty cool and fresh classic fusion tourbillon pieces in yellow and light blue ceramic attire. They come in a 45 millimeter case featuring a nice open work movement, are both limited to 30 pieces each and come at a comfy price of 90,000 Swiss francs. Okay, next brand, and we'll quickly talk about Zenith, who presented a new Chronomaster original triple date calendar with moon phase, repli replicating the original size of the historic model coming in a 38 millimeter steel case. And it is interesting to note that from the very start of the El Primero movement, Zenith had envisioned the fact that it could, that it could host a triple calendar complication. And in 1970, they could produce the 25 prototypes of this watch before launching it to production for quite a few years, but coming in a slightly bigger case. So when Zenith got their hands back on such a prototype model in 2012, well, that was just the start of what we're seeing today. And the result is rather pleasing, if I can say so. I mean, Zenith introduced uh, three variants, a silver dial with black subdial. Yes, Panda had to be done. A slate gray dial version with silver subdials and also limited to their boutique only version coming with an olive col colored dial. But worth noting that they are part of uh, the collection now, so not limited, and they are priced at 12,900 Swiss franc with uh, leather bracelets or 13,400 with steel bracelet. And talking about green, well, they also introduced the Chronomaster Sport Green timepiece. And uh, well, we know to whom they are aiming at this uh, with this one. Okay, next, and Tag Heuer, who remained in green for the launch of the new version of the Carrera Glassbox Chronograph, which features the original design characteristic of having only one subdial at three o'clock, and is obviously also an homage to the brand's past. Just a few years after the launch of the Carrera in the 60s, well, Heuer decided to do a version, the Dato 12, where they suppressed the running second subdial counter found originally at nine o'clock and placed the date there instead. So in terms of size, we're looking at a 39 millimeter steel case. And as its name implies, another important feature is this glass box, which really opens up the dial as much as possible. TAG is also pursuing with their lab made uh, diamond project and introduced the Carrera Dat uh, Plasma d'Avant-Garde with a bit of diamonds everywhere. The dial with this almost rough look, the two yellow tinted diamonds uh, for the crown, and where you will find the brand's logo, as well as baguette type diamonds uh, for the indices. 
there is uh, most certainly a lot of science be uh, behind this and wouldn't mind uh, knowing more to do, to be honest. So no price has been set uh, for this timepiece, which is in a certain way more the talking piece at this stage, but does open to some very interesting doors. And to conclude this LVMH week, let's quickly add that Bulgari introduced two very different versions of the more or less the same watch with the Octo Finissimo Automatic, coming in steel with a copper dial, but also a more flamboyant version with the full yellow gold version coming with a blue lacquered dial. Okay, we're coming close to the end of our timepiece review and I would like uh, to finish with the new Ikepod Megapod watch. And Ikepod is a brand for which there is a lot of affection, including me, of course, and to mark uh, cleverly its origin and the fact that Mark Newson, the famous designer, was at its inception, well, they came out with an original way of doing so. We probably all know and remember these fabulous looking hourglass precisely designed by Mr. Newson and as a tribute, well, they incorporated this in the watch itself as the contour of this hourglass is now the second hands of this timepiece. Like I said, quite clever, especially that it comes in uh, seven references, all limited to 100 pieces each. And with a price tag set at uh, 1290 Swiss franc, well, it's definitely uh, cheaper than buying the original hourglass model. So we're now almost over with this edition of Primetime. And just uh, for info, we will publish very shortly some uh, new videos on Horopedia, as this project is nicely accelerating in terms of video production after a long and necessary deployment of its structure. Well, now time to say goodbye. Thanks a lot for watching or for those downloading Primetime as a podcast and see you real soon for some additional watchmaking adventures. The very best to all and a huge Viva Watchmaking your way. See you.